morning, church family. Good morning. Let's give our praise team a round of applause. That was awesome this morning. <laughs> Terry Davis in the house. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to honor a young lady who had a birthday this last week. We didn't get her listed in the bulletin. This is Miss Sally Weaver. Today she turned, well, this last, yeah, actually today she turns 97 years young. Sally, would you stand? Would you stand, Sally? I'm not sure where you're at. We'll give her a round of applause. I don't, I'm not sure. She may not. She, she, yeah, all right. Here she is. Yeah. Right over here. Thank you for being with us this morning, Sally. We are so glad to have you. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, I hope you guys saw the Blended Bunch video. I don't know if you could see it from the back. Uh, Clay and Rhonda McConnell and Kirsten and I will be teaching a Bible class uh, starting next week uh, that's called Blended and Beautiful. Uh, it's, it's listed in your bulletin. And the purpose of the sermon series we've been preaching and teaching through is to emphasize the importance of community and family. And families come and communities come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, we have single parent families in this church and we love and honor and respect our single parent families. We have blended families in our church and we love and honor and respect uh, our blended families. And then we got a whole lot of different varieties of adopted families and families who just have a child by choice or uh, children who have kind of inherited a parent by choice. And Clay and Rhonda have a blended family. Uh, Clay gave me permission to share this with you, but over two years ago, I got to walk with Clay through his divorce. And this was a profoundly difficult time for him. Lots of transformation, lots of struggle, lots of uncertainty. And he really plugged into this church family and connected more deeply with the Lord Jesus Christ. And God brought him through that season. He and Rhonda met. Um, somehow he fooled Rhonda into marrying him. And if you see him, you can tell him that I said that. And, and they have a very happy, fulfilling marriage. And they are negotiating and navigating a blended family. So they're going to be teaching and talking from the view of parents. Kirsten and I each are children that come from blended families. And we're going to be kind of talking about blended families from the view of children. For, for my purposes today, I want to remind you how important family is. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean family by blood. Really, when we're talking about our WFR church family, it means family by and in the Spirit. That's what we've been talking about for weeks. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to conclude our uh, sermon series, Better Together, this morning. And I want to talk to you about why connection matters. Why connection matters. This is from Ephesians chapter 3. The two verses that I'm going to draw from this morning are some of my favorite in all of Scripture. And the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 3 verses 20 through 21 says this. Now to him, and, and he's concluding a prayer in this passage of Scripture, and he says, Now to him, to God who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now Paul has been talking about the power around us in the last part of Ephesians chapter 3. And here as he concludes this section and finishes his prayer, he transitions into talking about the power within us. And I want to remind you this morning that if you are in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a great and awesome power that is at work within you. Can I get an amen there? There is a great and awesome power at work within you. As a matter of fact, this is the greatest power in the known and in the unknown universe. It's a power that can literally bring the dead back to life. Can I get an amen for that? It is a power that can help you overcome any obstacle that you face in the life that you live. 
If you've come through a family tragedy, you've lost a loved one, a loved one has passed away, or you're working on trying to navigate a blended family, or uh, you feel isolated and you need to dig more deeply into this church family, whatever the struggle is, whatever the difficulty is, whatever the trial may be, whatever the tribulation may be, there is a great and awesome power that is the greatest power in the known and unknown universe that is at work within you. It's the same power that resurrected Christ from the dead. It's the power of the Spirit, and it's a power you have at your disposal. And I want to tell you this. It's never an issue for me of whether or not the power in you is greater than the powers you're going to come up against in the world. That's never the issue. The power that is at work within you is always greater than anything you're ever going to come up against in the world. The question we have to ask ourselves is not whether the power that is at work within me is sufficient, but is my level of surrender sufficient enough to allow that power liberty really to work in my situation? It's never an issue of the sufficiency of the power. It is an issue of the degree of your surrender to allow that power to work in your life. So Paul has kind of been talking about these two elements that come together. There's the power that works within us, and then in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, Paul talks about the power that is at work around us and with us. And that is other members in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've got this on screen for you. The Bible says, instead we should speak the truth in love. We will then grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The Apostle Paul and God himself wants you to understand that the power at work within you is easier to surrender to when you're connected to other men and women who also have that same power at work within them, who are also surrendered to that power. In a sense, it makes you like a war-ready soldier or a work-ready employee. That's some of the language that Paul's getting ready to use in Ephesians 6 and some that he uses here. This, This connection that we can have with others allows us to better harness that power that is at work within us And when we do, we can combine it with the power at work within those men and women who are also in the body of Christ, and we can become work ready. What good would a construction worker be if he showed up on the construction site with no hammer, with no nails, and no tools? Or how about a soldier who showed up on the front lines of battle with no protective equipment on and no artillery or ammunition or no weapon? That individual would be completely ineffective almost to the point of being utterly useless. And what the enemy wants you to do is to become extremely isolated and disconnected from God's people and not surrender to the power that works within you because there is a power that is working against you. There's absolutely a power that is working against you. This is found in Ephesians chapter 6. I've got this on the screen for you. I'm only going to give you one verse. You're going to know the whole section, 10 through 18, is where the Apostle Paul talks about this. But Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul says, this power that works against you puts you right in the middle of a very intense struggle. And the struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers and against the authorities and against the, here's this phrase here that, really caught my attention this week, the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You are absolutely in the middle of a very real struggle. It is absolutely a struggle that you cannot see, and it is absolutely a struggle that you can be victorious in. Somebody shout amen right there. I I guarantee you victory. I guarantee you victory as long as you follow this formula. This is what I've been talking about so far. I wrote this up on screen uh, so you could see it. If you add the power that is at work within you with the power that is at work with you and around you. So the power that is at work within you, that's the power of the Spirit. The most powerful force in the known and unknown universe. The same power that resurrected Christ from the dead. If you combine that power 
with the powers that work with you, other men and women who are members of the body of Christ, that when you combine your resources and talents and gift sets and abilities together, those powers combined are greater than any power that can ever work against you. They're greater than any power that can ever work against you. So, so think to yourself this morning. What's that one area of my life where it feels like the power that is at work against me is greater than any power I have access to? And I promise you the enemy is trying to get you to believe a lie about that struggle that really your power is inefficient or inadequate. And as long as you can surrender the power that works within you and you can connect with other men and women who are in Christ and combine those two powers together, there is never a power at work against you that you cannot be victorious over. Give the Lord a hand clap of, of praise for that truth. So this is why connection matters. Connection matters because when we connect what God is doing in us with what God is doing in the lives of people we're connected with around us, we, we become victorious. So I want to share with you a couple of ways that the enemy tries to disconnect us from the power at work within us or the powers that are working with us, around us, and other men and women in Christ to help you understand why connection is so important. Why you need to be connected to your family, your forever family, the other men and women of the Lord Jesus Christ that you are intended to live and do life with. The first thing I want to say is connection with God's people helps keep God at the center of your life. Connection with God's people helps keep God at the center of your life. It would be totally insane for, for any of you to drop me in the middle of the woods with a compass that didn't work and expect me to find my way out alive. It's not going to happen. Now, those of you who know me really well know that even if you drop me in the middle of the woods with a working compass, it might still be unrealistic to expect me to make my way out alive, right? But there are a couple of guys, if I could like phone a friend or have a person accompany me that I think could feed me uh, enough to keep me alive as I'm making my way out of the woods in the middle of nowhere. This is why it's so critical to have God at the center of your life. Without God at the center of your life, you have no direction, no point of reference, and no sense of destination. And while I'm talking about the powers at work outside of us, the powers of Satan, of the enemy, of darkness, those powers kind of use our natural sinful nature against us to pull us away from God being at the center of our lives. James puts it like this in James chapter 1 and verse 14. But each person is tempted when they are led and drug away by their own evil desire and enticed. The Apostle Paul in Romans talks about this same concept in verses 18 and 19 of chapter 7. He says, I have the desire to do what is good. I know there's a great power that works within me. I know that if I combine that with the power that's working in those around me who are also members of the body of Christ, that we can overcome whatever we are, are facing in life and be victorious. I know that, but I cannot do what I desire to do. I can't carry it out. For I, I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, that's what I keep on doing and some of you have faced that very real struggle in your lives or in your marriages or in your careers or in your personal spiritual walk it's like a trend I know what I need to do I know I shouldn't gossip but I find myself in a situation where I'm feeling a little bit insecure and blah, 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 it just diarrhea of the mouth comes right out or, or Trent, I know i got to surrender my finances to the Lord better. I know that's the good I should do. Or I know, like the subject of our talk today, that I should be connected better to God's people. But the good I so often want to do, I'm not able to do it. This is no doubt why the writer of Hebrews tells us this in chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Here's a thought I had about this that I want to share with you. 
Sometimes, church family, we are looking to receive from God what God intends for us to receive through others. And I believe in this context specifically, that's the motivation to keep on going or the motivation to do the right thing. Uh, my, my week normally looks like meeting with individuals and families from the church and in the community for 20, sometimes 30 hours in a week. And as a rule, when I'm meeting with people, they're kind of expecting this, what I would call magical moment, where your lips are closed. To, somebody knows that song. Does anybody know that song? Right? Okay. Um, I'm sorry about that. So we're, we're, we're expecting this magic moment where it's like, Lord, I'm struggling doing the right thing I know I should do, and I just need you to zap me from heaven and just give me the motivation to do it or just help me overcome my flesh. And, and to be perfectly clear, there are times where God grants us that power in a magic moment like that. But so often, God uses other men and women to speak to Trent's heart to motivate him to keep going or to do the right thing. Some of my closest friends in this forever family are the people that I depend on to like dig a spur in my side and be like, dude, you have got to do whatever it is you know you need to do. And, and it's those relationships and those individuals that help keep me motivated to keep the Lord Jesus Christ at the center of my life. And I think we intuitively get this sense. The question I'm asking myself is, why would we give up community? Why would we give up meeting together? Why would we not disclose to others what's going on? And that's because there's a gravitational pull within us to isolate and to hide and to conceal. And if we don't do anything other than what comes natural, that is what we are going to do. And so scripture has to teach us that we've got to learn to surrender to the power that is with, at work within us, and we've got to learn to connect ourselves with the people of God so we can resist the gravitational pull to put us first and God second and do what God commands, which is put Him first and us second. When we do that, we really learn to value our relationship with God, and we really learn to value our relationship with others. And this is another reason why connection really matters. First, it keeps God at the center of our life, but second, it teaches us to really value others. I've got this on the screen for you. This is Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. This is the Apostle Paul again who says, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. Now, when, when Jesus is asked what's the greatest command, he says, got it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And once God is at your axis, once God is at the center of your life, you can do the second most important command, which is to really love and value others. That's what he says. Love your neighbor as yourself. But we can't really love others if we don't really learn to love God first. And we cannot say... We cannot say we really love God if we do not love and value others. If we don't learn really to be devoted to one another in love and to be honoring others above ourselves, we cannot say we love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind. Those two cannot coexist. This is what's so profound about the church in the book of Acts as it begins its, its just baby steps towards its own development. Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. I wanted to read this to you this morning. I've got this on the screen as well. Uh, connection with God's people helps me learn to value others. Acts 2, 41 says, Those who accepted the message, they were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. 
Every single day, they, count, they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The secret to church growth is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, Mark says. And the second is to really learn to value and love other people. That's the process of church growth in Acts 2. First, you got to accept the message. Then you got to be baptized. Then you need to join the local church. That's what Acts says right here. But don't just leave it at that. Don't just show up at the scheduled temple court meeting and sing and praise the Lord and shake people's hands and show up in, in, in a suit and, and go through the motions. Take it outside the church into the streets and into people's homes and into people's lives and invite people in your life and, and do life together. And when we really learn to do life together and when we really learn to love one another and to honor each other above ourselves, God pours out a blessing on that community that takes care of everything that needs to be taken care of. That's why it's so critical for us to be aware that life is intended to be lived together. And it gets better when we live life together. When we're living life together and, and being victorious in struggles and challenging each other and growing, we then, over time, can become mature Christians. Connection is critical because it helps me to become a mature Christian. Let me give you Hebrews 5. 12 through 14. The writer of Hebrews says, In fact, by this time, you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You still need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, which that is a terrifying idea to a person like me who loves to eat, all right, but it's even scarier thinking about how true this is for so many individuals and churches today. Anyone who lives on milk, still being an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. What's the mark of physical maturity? The mark of physical maturity, not how long you can grow a beard, which is kind of a thing in our community, let's be honest. Okay? It's not whether or not you root for a winning championship-level football team like LSU, okay? That's not the mark of, of physical maturity, all right? It's not how big of a buck you can kill on an annual basis, and there aren't many people in our church who kill large deer anyway, so quit playing like y'all do. <laughs> um, it's not how delicious of cakes and cookies you can bake for your preacher, although I do think that's significant, <laughs> if I may say so myself. And the Lord does show special favor on those who treat his ministers <laughs> with that level of love. I, I didn't intend to go there, but I just want to speak the truth to you this morning in love. Um, none of those are really the marks of physical maturity. And maybe the most basic way I could say it, the mark of physical maturity is when you have the capacity to reproduce. Okay, that's maybe the easiest way I could say it. And I want to translate that to spiritual maturity. I think that may be the easiest way for us to understand spiritual maturity. Can you reproduce yourself? And I want to ask you this morning, if you were to reproduce you 5 or 10 or 50 or even 100 times, what would the church made mostly up of your reproductions of your own self look like? Would it be a church that kind of was gossipy or that stuck to its own crowd and kind of kept others out? Uh, would it be a church that was sort of stingy, expecting other people to take care of others' needs or other people to do the jobs? Or, or, or would it be a church that really loved God's people? And maybe more importantly, would it be a church that, that had practiced some of what the writers of Hebrews say here? You know what the mark of a mature Christian is? Somebody who constantly, constantly, constantly uses what they have been taught. 
That's the mark of a mature Christian. Do you go about your life thinking, how does what I'm about to listen to match up and align with God's Word? How does what I'm about to watch match up and align with God's Word? How does what I'm about to say match up and align with God's Word? How does what I'm about to do match up and align with God's Word? How does what I'm thinking match up and align with God's Word? Are you developing a constant awareness of the degree to which you are using what you're taught? Or do you walk away and forget what you've been taught and live however you want to live? Second thing a mature Christian does is they have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. And that's active voice. That's not God doing something for you. That's you participating in the process of your own maturity. Can you distinguish good from evil in your own life? And I'm promising you, in the same way there is a gravitational pull for us to become isolated and disconnected and conceal our struggles, there is an inner voice that is constantly trying to get us to justify to our own selves doing the wrong thing. Man, you don't really not need to watch that. It's okay if you listen to that. Just go ahead and talk about this certain person. Just tell them it's a prayer request. Or you don't need to give your time there. You don't really have to give your money. Or somebody else will take care of it. You're too busy doing it. Those are the kinds of things that we're constantly battling against. And if we are not constantly using what we have been taught, and if we are still struggling distinguishing good from evil, you're immature. And you're still feasting on milk when there is such a depth to the cuisine, to stick with the language and the metaphor here, that the Lord God offers in the life of the Spirit. My challenge to you is become mature to the point that you can replicate yourself, and you're no longer a student, but you become a teacher. And it's in that moment where you find purpose and meaning in life, and that's another way connection is so critical, another reason connection is so critical. It helps us find purpose and meaning in life. I got these two scriptures on the screen. First, I want to go uh, to 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 58. The Bible says this, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I've got that in the very next slide here, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, and, And Paul's point here in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, sorry, is that we always can give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord because we know that there's always going to be a return on our investment in the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you can have a give it all attitude because you know that God is going to value every little bit of the all that you give. And it's not until you learn to have a give-it-all attitude and leave it all on the field and really leave walking away exhausted and beat up and feeling like you've been kicked in the teeth that the comfort of God can manifest itself in your life and strengthen you and encourage you to face the next day and the next day and the next day. And that comfort is something God gives you that he doesn't intend for you to keep, which is Paul's point in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4. Not everything God gives you is intended just for you. As a matter of fact, most of what God gives, he expects you to just be an intermediary. And that's most clear with this idea of comfort. Here's another truth. The more comfort you give to others, the more comfort you're going to receive from God. We live in a world, whether we like it or not, with a limited pie mentality. And you know this to be true. Man, I'm, I'm going to help this certain person out. But man, they're the only person I can help out this week. I'm going to give this person maybe a little bit of money, but man, that's all I got to give. You cannot outgive. you cannot out-bless God. You cannot do it. And the comfort that God has shown you, if you'll turn around and reflect that comfort into the lives of others, you'll find that there is an unceasing, never-ending well of comfort that God just lavishes, that he just pours out onto you. 
And here's the, here's the last truth. The more comfort you give, the more purpose you'll have in life, the more fulfilled you'll be. I'm not saying you won't be physically tired. I'm not saying there won't be moments where you're exhausted, where you feel spread out, but you're not going to be burnt out. You're not going to be defeated. You're not going to be depressed, and you're not going to be discouraged because every bit you give, God will return to you and help you realize your purpose. And I think this is the number one way God discourages men and women who are members of his family. If he can take you out of the game of encouraging and comforting others and you don't have purpose, then you don't have direction. And if you don't have direction, you're lost. Kirsten and I travel around some, um, and I can remember there was a time we were lost in a large city. And uh, I'm just like you guys. When a man is lost, what does he do? He pretends like he knows exactly where he is. Come on, somebody. All of y'all do that. And all of you ladies somehow always know that we're faking it. And so my bride, man, she is so patient and just loving. She, she makes a few gentle passes. And ladies, there's so much wisdom in that. She'll say, babe, you know, I feel like we've passed this way before. I'll tell, you what, I'll tell you what happened. We were in Dallas, and it was like midnight, and I was following my GPS, and it kept taking us through this industrial park. <clears throat> I swear, I promise. And the second time we passed through the same area, Kirsten was like, babe, um, I feel like I've seen these buildings before. <laughs> and I said, babe, it's, it's midnight, you know, um, of the two of us, I, I cracked a joke. I was like, you're the one who wears glasses. Like, I promise you haven't seen this before. So about 10 minutes later, same set of buildings, same exact area. And she's like, babe, um, do you recognize where we're at? This feels really familiar. And, and, and by the third time, I promise you, we passed through the same area. She's like, she says, babe, do you want me to go ahead and drive? Uh, she could not have handled it any better. And here's what was going on within me when I had no direction and I was really lost. I was totally and completely focused on me, on my anxiety, my discomfort, my uncertainty, my own insecurity. And that's the most vulnerable position we can be in. And the best way to avoid that is to have people journeying with us in life who have been there, who know the lay of the land, and who also know the way out, because the same power that resurrected Christ from the dead that's at work within us is also at work within them. That's why connection matters. I want you to get involved in a community group, this community group season, and I want you to pour into your group, and I want you to feel supported and encouraged and loved and with direction so that your life can have the purpose and the meaning God intended. I'm going, to dis I'm going to close us. I'm going to close our service with a prayer. If you're a visitor here, after I close, we're all going to stand up and sing. And if you have a need in your life for anything, physical illness, struggling with something spiritual, maybe you're feeling isolated and alone and lost, and you just want to come forward and have the church pray over you, or perhaps... You've never been baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ. The old you has not been put to death, and you have not been raised up to walk a brand new life filled with the Spirit. This is the time to do that. If you have any of those needs, I invite you to come forward and let us minister to whatever needs you have in your life. Please bow with me while we pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your church. Uh, thank you so much for Jesus. I just ask that we would live in obedience to him by surrendering the power that is at work within us, surrendering to the power that is at work within us, and learning how to connect with your people so that we can combine those two elements of the, of the Christian life and walk and live in victory. I ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Please stand with me while together we sing.